there we go. So, all right, um, all right, first things first, I guess, let me just attempt to share something. Let's see how that goes today. Um, so you see our learning management system already. I'll get uh, back to that in a second. It's probably quite different from what you know from elsewhere. Okay. Um, if, um, uh, see, Mark or Marius, uh, can you keep an eye on the chat? Uh, because I'm not always able to do that in, in uh, when I'm a full screen. Yeah, sure, we'll do. Uh, um, so if there's comments, um, yeah, cool. All right, um, cloud technologies. Well, you know, cloud technologies is the course. I think that's how it's called. Hopefully it's still called. Uh, over the years, we kind of have made attempts to kind of rename it and reshape it. But I think cloud technologies is most generic and, uh, you know, kind of more general uh, concept and captures a wide range of different uh, perspectives. But what are um cloud technologies anyway so that's a question to you as students what are cloud technologies i presume you will pay attention to chat now right <laughs> if i see it despite my full screen situation uh, yes i will there you go uh yeah one first <laughs> feedback it's a magical place i love that one it's in the cloud yeah that's right remote data storage <laughs> they're good susanna thank you yeah that's right, remote data storage. Um, what are other points? What are cloud technologies? Is, did anyone use cloud technology before to some extent? Or, 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 or fears or claims they did? Let's see. Ah, Dropbox, yeah, it's an example, right? So it's an um, example of cloud technology that we'll uh, find, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, so what are the necessary in ingredients of cloud technology? Or what's what's the main feature that makes something a cloud technology as opposed to, uh, well, in, let's call it a non-cloud technology? Uh -huh. Yes, so we have a reference of uh, ah, Adobe Cloud. Yes, that's an interesting one. So there's, uh, there's a local cloud. Um, accessibility um, is mentioned here. Um, what do you mean with accessibility specifically? Um, Ah, right, right, right. Okay, right. Yeah, okay, I follow you. So general accessibility is uh, the the idea, right? So assets that are accessible from anywhere, uh, that's right. Um, Katinka highlights that uh, it's about transfer and storage. Yeah, there's something to that one. That's right. Very important point. Um, assets from anywhere. So it's about this whole distributedness, right? Is it only about kind of um, um uh, data transfer or is there another dimension that we could think about in terms of um, cloud technologies yeah vm right that's right so you guys uh, are starting to get the ah there you go say there you go that's right so um yeah we get a new some input here we have vm switch machines we have um uh, AWS, uh, there's Kubernetes as uh, uh, more like an infrastructure alongside, um, well, possibly rather um, um, in, in the background, so it may not be as prominently visible. Uh, we make a reference to GCP, so Google uh, Computing Platform uh, is also mentioned here as well. Yes, um, so this is really more the backend. Okay, this is all infrastructure. So um, I have the subtle intuition that you guys have a back background in infrastructure development or programming configuration and so on. But um, uh, this provides the the basis. For, uh, first, we heard about more applications like Dropbox and communication and transfer of information and data. And now we're learning more about like the infrastructure. But what what are kind of features that, for example, AWS uh, um, offers that you know, you can exploit. And I'm thinking of you as now uh, developers in the widest sense. If we get back to the characterization of you uh, in a way. Aha, uh -huh, cool. Application programming interfaces is, is a reference here. So um, the idea is there that uh, you, you are, you're exposed to functionality via an interface that 
uh, you can program against, right? So and this will basically shape, I mean, the essence of the entire course, as you'll find um, sooner or later, um, the entire course, at least the practical aspects of the course, not so much all the theory that we're going to talk about. But what's happen what happens in the cloud as well? I'm looking for one particular aspect that we haven't covered yet. So we have storage, we have transfer. What else was there? Security is an important point, right? So here's the careful thing. I nearly said security is an important uh, secondary aspect of cloud, but I should not say that. So uh, it's of course a very important primary aspect, but it usually doesn't offer the, it, it's not like the, 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 the value proposition that sits on uh, security, right? So it's something else that you actually use. Security is something you need to take care of in any instance. So security is very important. And we'll also talk a, admittedly only a bit about this. Um, 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 most of you will have a dedicated security course anyway, but nevertheless, security is an important aspect. But what is happening else in the cloud? What, what else is happening? So is it just storing about data, keeping them accessible, which is all great? Is it about programming against um, cloud um, solutions? But is there anything else that we need to Bear in mind, VMs gets the closest. Ah, there you go, Stephen. Yeah, processing information, of course, right? So um, that's the idea, right? So it's also processing capability um, that you can use and exploit. So it's not only about sharing uh, and synchronizing data, which is probably, uh, I guess, the more visible uh, feature or aspect of cloud technologies, but uh, the processing uh, of it remotely uh, in, 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 in a large scale in particular is one of the key thing. Um, the, the last comment is actually something we're going back to uh, soon as well. It's like good for business. And um, the, the, the idea, yeah, there is something to it. There's actually uh, some value um, that we can exploit and kind of you know, make it useful for, for businesses. What that is concretely is something we're going to explore further, of course, like to put a bit of a finger on, if you like. Uh, but uh, that's fundamentally right. Cool. Yeah. So we have a rough understanding, right? So it's about... It involves uh, infrastructure, right? So um, that's probably doesn't sit on your own computer. So that's pretty good already. So that's, you know, uh, on someone else's computer, abstractly speaking. Um, and uh, then we have um, processing capabilities that we can offload into the cloud, into this remote computer or systems. Um, and then with storage, we can uh, offload there as well. And of course, we kind of rely a bit on networking. Otherwise, the whole business kind of doesn't work, right? So cloud technologies without networking is probably not really uh, a sensible um, um, feature. So we need to talk about this a bit um, as well. Cool. Uh, Marsh just pointing out, we can also see uh, security uh, security as a service, right? Because um, we, we're starting even outsourcing security aspects to it as well. I mean, that can, uh, of course, I mean, the network capability makes it quite flexible already uh, in the in the, in the the first place. Um, so that we actually, you know, use third party services for anything, including security, right? So uh, password managers is something that Marius um, mentioned. So, um, yep. So uh, Seem is making a point here. So don't we have that already? So the whole outsourcing as security uh, based on Microsoft Defender for, for, for endpoints and so on. Um, I think this the idea that um, firewalls and antivirus solutions have kind of used uh, central service has been around for a while. Um, the, the, this is yeah, this is certainly a feature that is that is used. Um, um, without without much uh, doubt, because I mean the, the value of firewalls is actually protect uh, from uh, uh, or uh, to to guard the network security in the widest sense. So it would be surprising if that was not used um, um, to kind of you know centrally um, analyze information and um, um, configure systems. Yeah. All right. So we get back to those those kind of uh, more specific characterizations. I think you guys should also be feel free to elaborate on those uh, if you want to, either in chat or uh, with voice or whatever works for you. Um, but I think we leave it at this because this is literally the first five minutes of the session and we don't want to go too deep into uh, some some um, uh, cans of worms, if you like. So um, we kind of have a bit of an overview of what cloud technology is uh, in the widest sense. Um, so uh, dimensions are infrastructure, um, certainly applications, and uh, to some extent programming. Someone mentioned APIs, so it's an important one. Um, we had examples, um, including uh, Dropbox, AWS as infrastructure. Um, and the um, um, yeah, so um, I, I think various intuitions that you are comfortable with. In fact, one example that you probably all used already is like Office 365, right? So that you are more or less um, get for free when you join university here. 
um, that you can use for your activities or the whole um, Google suite, um, Google Docs, um, Google Drive and so on, um, has, has um, also cloud features. And it kind of shares this accessibility and convenience factor that uh, was pointed out very much earlier. Cool. All right. Um, so before going deeper into those topics, just to seed the motivation, because that's, uh, I think, um, quite important. And in the meantime, we have 68 participants, so pretty much everyone is here, um, as, at least the ones signed up. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to briefly talk about some teaching principles that we put forth here and the staff involved. Um, and then I'm going deeper into the course outline. So to kind of give you a bit of a set of expectations that we are, that you're going to, going to, aspects you're going to see. I'm not going detail and going by session level. Some people may prefer this, but that's not how we generally do it here because we kind of follow your pace, not so much ours. Um, but fundamentally the topics that will be discussed, they are covered uh, here as well. Following that, um, the, um, I'm going through the kind of the learning environment, the infrastructure that we are going to use for this course. Um, so it's important. I mean, you got a gist of it already because I more or less uh, uh, encouraged you to uh, sign up for, for GitLab in order to um, follow the, the information. And I'll elaborate on this a bit more, why we use this. And um, then afterwards, I want to learn a bit more about you and your kind of um, setup as um, uh, uh, degrees you're coming from. I have a rough understanding, but I want to get a better understanding of the proportions. So uh, uh, we, we um, kind of um, have a basis to prepare ourselves for the upcoming sessions. That also includes a bit of a background which I again have a vague understanding about, but many of your degrees are either new or, new or renewed. And so it's really worthwhile to uh, kind of learn more about um, the specifics. And then we move on into kind of some principles of cloud technology. We'll see how far the lecture takes us and then we take on uh, over from there or continue from there then um, on Friday if needed um, and to continue that. So um, without much further ado, uh, just, just uh, 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 dropping a few names here because most likely you see some of us again or again, um, the person that has been talking for now pretty much, uh, I guess, 15 minutes, so much already, is me, Christopher Franz. So I'm at the Department of Computer Science um, and um, I'm, I'm teaching there and researching there, of course. And if you um, see me doing something else, but teaching is mostly related to one of the topics that I mentioned under my interest, which would be agent-based modeling, institution analysis, or policy coding. So uh, actually encoding real legal text and policy and analyzing it. So if anyone wants to do something in that area, get in touch with me. It could be quite interesting. I think um, Marsh can introduce himself. Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Marius. I'm also associate professor, same as Christopher. I work here since 2013, uh, focusing on my research mostly on decentralized technologies, mobile, uh, blockchain, uh, cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrency forensics. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, um, I'm your man. So talk to me. Um, yeah, and you will, some of you will see me in some of the other courses. Thanks. Definitely. And uh, to largely say in this course. So, um, so forget about the other courses. This is the important one here. So, um, and uh, other, other person that will join us or will also teach and support, uh, you know, in, in many respects is uh, Siama Khatami. If you like, you can also introduce yourself. So Max, uh, everyone sees your face and hears your voice, so they know a bit more about you. And please, I mean, the, the interest is something I, uh, I, I derived based on my understanding, um, but uh, feel free to compliment or change that. Uh, yeah, please. Oh, you're it. welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Siamak. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate here. I'm working with Christopher. Uh, you can see that there are kind of things that we are working, but mostly uh, we are working on agent-based modeling and somehow cloud computing yeah that's right that's cool in, in any case we're using cloud computing right that's the yeah link. that's probably the linking pin here so um and yes we'll rely on your expertise um so but but you also you can share a bit about your background i mean you you have uh engaged in kind of um you know entrepreneurship activities before right so uh, like... yes actually i have few ideas at the moment and some startups that i paused them freezed because of some sort of things that we have here at ntnu you know mm -hmm. i'm working here and i can't develop any kind of business yeah but yes uh, we can do pretty good things with each other i mean with students here and uh, I think it will be very good the output. Yeah. So we good. So we'll, we'll bring that bit more some more of the innovation ideas uh, throughout the course later on uh, when we get to it, right? So, but I think cloud first. Put it yes. This way. <laughs> 
Cool. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> There are two more uh, participants or today non-participants for valid reasons. So both of them has a val have a valid excuse because they have competing courses. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and that is Jon Gunnar Fossum and uh, Leon Cinquemani, both of them who did the actual bachelor in programming. So they are homegrown, if you like. So they went through the same or through the previous version of the same program um, that some of you are going through. And uh, they are now Master of Applied Computer Science students here in Jörvik as well. And uh, they have kind of extensive experience in um, areas specifically in game development, but uh, they also took the cloud course, of course. And specifically, Leon is uh, very keen and interested in computer graphics. So you may actually, uh, if you if you are still, I'm not sure right now, but if you're still taking that course, you may actually encounter him um, there as well. But they again, they're not joining us today um, and likely not so much on the Wednesday session because again, they have competing lectures. But since we're in an online remote setting, uh, the plan is to do a lot of support asynchronously and I get back to that as well uh, anyway, but they will be available for the respective other session. When it comes about uh, when it comes to lecture structure or the course principles, the layout more more realistically, it's a mix of uh, lectures on the one hand and um, practical tutorials um, on on the other hand. And um, as you will have seen in the schedule, most likely this very session is tagged as Irving, so meaning as as um, exercises um, tutorial. Um, but uh, this simply doesn't respond or um, uh, not necessarily always correspond to um, uh, how we use those corresponding sessions because, again, we want to see and follow the, um, the, the, the pace and process that you guys are engaging in, but also the availability of, you know, our, our TAs, right? So if um, they're not available, then this is certainly not happening to be a tutorial session or a, a, a support session in the widest sense. But generally, we try to have a sensible distribution of lectures on the one hand, but um, lecture heavy in the beginning, and uh, then more Q and A centric uh, towards the latter part of the course, where it's really about you um, driving some of the themes and challenges as well. <clears throat> In addition to kind of us uh, disseminating or sharing information or teaching in the widest sense, uh, the, the peer interaction will be a central feature of this course, right? So we expect you to kind of also, well, not only necessarily to help yourself, but to interact, to learn by interaction in the widest sense, right? Because we follow one principle that is uh, learning by construction. Um, and the, the idea is that you're building, you know, tools, uh, programs, software to learn about the underlying principles. Right. And the best learning is done to some extent with interaction because, of course, we need to assess you individually. Uh, ultimately, many of the assignments are individual ones, not all of them. Um, but uh, as part of this, so if you want to, you know, uh, get help, uh, debug your problem or share solutions, we encourage you to do this within the community, I meaning within our community at least. If you're engaging outside of our community as well, in you know, in public fora, that's perfectly sensible. But I'm talking about the course here specifically. Um, as, as relevant for us. So uh, for this purpose, we have the kind of, uh, you know, a shared learning management system that we're going to talk about and a peer review system that I'm not yet going to talk about, but it's actually um, something that we are going to implement uh, during um, the assessment stages in particular, as you will see. <clears throat> so um, what uh, the other aspects um, that I just want to highlight here, um, there's always the misc or the conception that this course is just about programming. And um, um, while some of you would prefer it to be this way, it's it's not, right? So we are also at a university um, in the sense that we also need to uh, provide you conceptual background and a bit of a, a, a theoretical background um, as well as um, transfer knowledge, right? Knowledge that is more general and permeates the entire degree or your entire degrees, because again, you're quite diverse in your background, I understand. Um, and so it's not just about uh, uh, programming, which you would certainly do, but also about thinking about design, implementation, evaluation, and presentation aspects of things that you actually develop. And on top of this, we're also looking at um, 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 other dimensions of cloud computing that are not technological, as you'll see. So just to bring this up and highlight this quite early in um, the course. And it becomes a bit clearer, hopefully, when I just share the course outline um, in, in terms of rough topics. We'll briefly go over the course directive afterwards, so you, you are very clear about the learning outcomes. But um, one of the things that we really need to seed or get a good understanding of is really the basics of Linux. Um, then there is the uh, programming language that will accompany us throughout the entire course. So that will be um, provided by Marshall Wustavsky. 
um, and it's Golang, it happens to be Go. And there's a bit of an overlap between two courses. In fact, between the advanced programming course, which is um, um, held for the bachelor in programming students, but not necessarily the other students. So the idea was there that we kind of um, do the introduction into Golang in this very course here, because uh, um, it, this, this provides then a good uh, basis for both uh, courses to, to move um, further. And uh, the bachelor and programming students don't hear that information twice, which would be a bit of a shame. It happens, though, however, um, that Golang is, or we choose Golang as the language for cloud um, uh, technology because it has um, in, um, experienced increasing uptake. Now it's 10 years old, I believe, if not a bit older, 11 or something. Um, and uh, prominence and uh, the fact that it's openly available and uh, follows uh, the general, general open source principles is uh, really um, makes it very, very attractive for us to, to learn about it. Of course, there are other programming languages that can be used for cloud services. In fact, most of the programming languages can be used to some or app used, if you like, for cloud services. But we just specifically use Golang and you'll see its convenience later on when we talk about API design. The um, one of the concepts that you're going to learn about is REST services, so uh, representation, representational state transfer services. Quite a bit of a um, seemingly well old technology, but a very important technology, and uh, in large instances uh, underlying the infrastructure of the web nowadays as it's run and done. And you're going to learn about uh, specifications and more generally, we we'll also push it a bit and uh, um, learn more generally about how to read specifications for such um, concepts, right? So um, that's where the transfer knowledge comes in. You'll learn how to design those, hopefully, and of course, implement them, right? So that sits alongside as well. So uh, in addition, we talk about the general cloud principles. So we heard a lot about, or we read rather, a lot about as a service kind of things, right? So the um, asterisk uh, risk as a service uh, concepts. Um, and uh, we'll talk a bit about those a bit more, hopefully perhaps even today briefly, um, but also the associated aspects uh, of, of economic nature. You know, what are the values? What's the benefit and cost? But also what are the risks? That's something you also need to take into account, always need to take into account when we think about uh, value. Um, so some of you have a bit of an operations background, but not all. So again, this course is really more like an intersection between different degrees in many respects. So we also need to talk a bit about info operations in a wider sense. And we use as an example OpenStack. Um, in fact, we use our uh, locally hosted um, uh, instances of OpenStack, um, Sky High. Some of you will know it, I'm very certain. Others not. So we need to be fair to each other that um, some people will be new to this um, uh, infrastructure. Um, but we'll use this as a, uh, in the, I think, halfway through the course is something we're um, uh, attempting to do. So that's in, in that time frame, you'll probably get acquainted with this. And associated with this, we talk about Docker. Um, so it's like uh, application level virtualization, if you like. We, again, uh, it doesn't need to make sense at this stage, but we'll get back to it at a later stage. And then, again, uh, I mentioned before that we tap into the opportunities, not only from a uh, economic perspective, but also from a kind of innovation perspective um, into cl of cloud technology later in, in the course. And all this is accompanied or kind of the pinnacle of this, hopefully, is that you are in the position to kind of devise um, and design your own um, project. At the end, there will be a group project um, that um, you can use, we provide you some resources, of course, but also use, rely on your creativity to come up with sensible kind of cloud projects that you want to see um, implemented possibly. And um, um, then you can shape your groups around those uh, concepts. So you kind of bring many of the aspects that we discuss here uh, together. Of course, not all, but um, many of them in any case. Are there any questions um, at this stage? I don't see any of so that seems to be okay about now. Uh, could we publish the slides used? Of course, the slides, I get back to that in a second when I talk about the learning management system, um, the resources will all be provided. Um, yeah, no worries there. So you don't need to take uh, active no meaning you don't need to copy the slides. If you want to take notes, you, you should definitely do so. I, in fact, encourage people to take notes to identify what's sensible, important to them and the kind of contextual aspects of it. Um, but uh, um, yes, the slides will be provided. Okay, um, right, 
cool. Um, just to highlight a few, some of the challenges we are encountering. So we, um, uh, the, the course is, will to some extent be a bit agile uh, and has always been, I guess. Uh, and this is in f for many reasons. To some extent, it's a new course. And some people will ask you, hey, hang on, is it really a new course? Wasn't there an old cloud technology course? Yes, there was, um, of course. But this course needs to is different in both its um, shape, form, and extent, meaning it's now a seven and a half point course. Most of you will know that. And uh, the um, um, students taking it are different now. Usually um, it's quite different from before. So we need to kind of accommodate this as well as well. Um, of course, cloud technologies itself will change or changes continuously. We had some uh, interesting um, um, experience in, the, in, in previous iterations, you know, about technology being replaced at some stage and so on. So we need to watch the space a bit carefully. And then there's this remote teaching business. Well, I guess we all kind of got used to that one throughout the last semester, but nevertheless, it presents us with some challenges that we probably need to uh, encounter and kind of together uh, find the best possible solution um, two when challenges arise. So um, the challenges for you, as far as I understand them, and perhaps you have better ones, um, so I give you an opportunity in a second to kind of clarify this a bit more, um, is really that you, of course, need to learn a new programming language. Um, and generally learning new programming languages is some, 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 it's a challenge, right? Because um, you will, it depends what background you have, which languages you know, and uh, also um, that you need to put varying extents of um, um, effort into learning that new language, because for some of you it would simply come a lot easier, for some a lot uh, more challenging, right? So um, that's uh, quite natural, um, that, that as we'll find. So th that's something you want to take into account. So it doesn't, you, yeah, it's not something we can plan for, anticipate entirely, but it's something we need to kind of go with the flow and kind of see how, how it works. Um, the other aspect is you, that you want to learn more about uh, principles of cloud technologies, you know, and make uh, be a bit more in a role of a decision maker when to use what, right? So we have different technologies, but your choice is your 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 your, your, your skill is not only to recognize those different uh, concepts, but also to decide, you know, because you as a designer uh, are uh, not just following instructions, but you also need to kind of um, um, make a call on, you know, wh when to use which technology. And I think that's something you want to get out here as well. Uh, as part of the course. And um, yeah, again, I mentioned all those um, uh, qualitative aspects of um, cloud technologies, like the economics, the legal aspects that we need to talk about. In fact, I tapped into one of them uh, earlier uh, in this session by asking you whether you want to have a recording, right? Because I need to get your, your, your um, approval. Um, and that's similar for cloud computing as well, right? There are security aspects, but also legal aspects that you need to be mindful of. So we have some some uh, talk about this, and then of course operations. And I know this is not a not will not be an operations course, but you will nevertheless need to get an understanding of um, some of the essential functions of operations as well, in as far as they're relevant for deployment, for example. So just that's my view on the challenges that we're facing. And I just want to be transparent about the challenges that we are facing as well. I hope that uh, gives a bit of clarity. So um, so the, the classical aspect that should always be covered in the first first session is to get a clear, um, ha have some sort of expectation management on aspects that you know we can negotiate or modify in the course and some aspects that are firm and fixed. So I just want to call out those quite um, um, quickly and do this in conjunction with introducing you to our learning um, environment in a wider sense. So I'll now switch to kind of GitLab and give uh, you a understanding. So um, most of you hopefully signed up to um, GitLab in the meantime, right? There was the link I sent around. Um, there's two hurdles, as I mentioned in my earlier email. One of them is getting into GitLab in the first place, which is now based on approval by a administrator. So in practice, it will be uh, Marius uh, and, uh, and myself. Um, this is kind of a one-off kind of uh, activity. So once you're on the system, you're on the system. There's also the instance that you had an account on GitLab, but it apparently is blocked. And um, Marish, do you want to elaborate on this and the procedure associated with this? So uh, we have asked uh, last year for students to update their bio field uh, such that it is in a form of uh, the year you started your studies with the program and with your student ID in order for us to be able to, you know, grade your uh, submissions, assignments, and so on. So, so to make our life easier, and also to filter out some of the people who might potentially abuse the system because it is publicly available online anyway. 
Um, so those rules have been for a while, but some of the some of you, some of the students didn't follow the the uh, the bio thing, and I had to clean up the installation at the beginning of January. And in the process, those people who don't have the bio field properly formatted as we requested, they got blocked. So if if you happen to be one of those students, you just send me an email or send me a message on the, on um, on Discord. And just tell me what your email is or what your uh, ID, like username on uh, GitLab is, and then I will unblock you. And then you can kind of fill up the, the bio form such that it will not happen to you again next January when I will be doing the cleanup. So that's the, the situation. If you have an account with a non NTNU email, you can keep it. Uh, so we still hold the people who already have accounts and projects in GitLab. Uh, if you don't have an account in GitLab yet, then you will have to use NTNU email when you're creating yourself an account. Um, other than that, yeah, I, I think for any trouble or anything, just uh, send me an email or, or send me a text message on uh, on Discord. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so that's important. Um, so a bit of change there. Um, and once you get into the system, that's the more that's the more general thing, right? Because it applies to all courses that use GitLab. Or in fact, uh, if you just want to use GitLab, because GitLab is also open for you to use to host your own projects, like especially if they're meant to be visible only internally within uh, NTU or your your you know your groups and so on. So that's a nice opportunity, Marsh. Yeah, so so in addition to that, there, there are multiple GitLab servers. So some students get a yeah. bit confused because we have a GitLab server in Jovic. There is one GitLab server, you know, uh, global called gitlab.com. Uh, there is a GitLab server and ED in Trondheim, uh, also for student projects. Uh, that one in Trondheim is using the um, your already existing credentials from NTNU such that you don't need to create an account. You just need to log in using your normal NTNU credentials. The one which we're hosting in Jovic is a little bit more, um, uh, let's say experimental and it's isolated from NTNU systems in such a way that you do have to create your, your own account. Uh, it's not linked with NTNU services and because it's not linked, we can do certain things with it because we have kind of a contained security model, right? So if mm. things go wrong, it will not affect the rest of the university. Whereas if something goes wrong with the, the Trondheim one, it may have more severe, you know, uh, replications, repercussions. So in any, any case, just make sure that you use the correct uh, URL that points to our GitLab server. Um, and um, the advantage of the Jovig one is that we don't, uh, basically that it's local. So if you, for example, have, you are gaming students and you want to have large uh, repository with a lot of assets and your repo is quite big, uh, the, um, you will be basically using LAN, like uh, local speeds uh, because of the, proximity of the storage. And also we don't have uh, restrictions on the number of projects, although th there is a default restriction, but we can kind of easily lift it for you. And we have the ability to host large objects and also the pipelines. So there are some things that we do slightly differently to the one in Trondheim, but of course you can use the Trondheim one for your uh, student projects too. Uh, in some courses we force you uh, or ask you to use our one, uh, because then we have everything kind of uh, scripted and kind of controlled uh, and we can do certain things in automatic uh, fashion. So for this course and for uh, the programming courses, uh, we do lectures and kind of uh, some of the activities in this Discord. Therefore, it's kind of easy if, if we do assignments or submissions through this Discord as well, because then peer review and everybody's already here and you can kind of easily do that. But for project work and for your, you know, final year bachelor work, we quite flexible at which Git sort of system you're using. You can use GitHub, you can use other systems as long as you have a Git repository that you can submit. And that Git repository has an open public access such that peer review and our reviews can happen. You know, it has to be accessible. Uh, so that's just like a, a, a little bit of a clarification about the, the different Git lab and Git storage setups. Cool. 
Well, that was a handful um, talking about cloud services, right? Um, so um, yes, cool. Thank you very much, uh, Marsh. If you can, there, there was a question about the biofilm format in the chat and a response uh, by Seem, but I think we also need a response for um, the format for international students uh, or exchange students as well, right? Because they have a different for format of the biofield, isn't it? Correct. So so uh, Seaman gave a very good uh, template. Follow that template if you are international student. Uh, just say, you know, or exchange student, just say the year you started and in the middle you say exchange student. Uh, if you don't have a student ID, yeah, okay, don't, don't, don't write it down. Uh, but make sure that you are identifiable. So either you use a proper name, surname in your account profile and you are kind of identifiable that you are a real person and we can, we can know who you are, right? Uh, this is important for submitting assignments and things like this, mm -hmm. because as I said, we don't use the NTNU uh, credential system um, strictly. So, so semen, semen pattern in chat is the one to use. And yeah, if you cannot fill certain fields, just uh, write something human readable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. So that's that's kind of the backdrop against it. So, but now we're in the system, and you you identified clearly by the URL, right? It's git.jovic.ed.ntnu. So that's the one we are gonna use. Um. So, so where's the landing page you want to go to? Well, once you sign up into the project, go to the wiki. Uh, effectively down here. So there's a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff we actually don't really use, especially in this project, which you may want to exploit and you know explore for your own projects, which have kind of the same layout. So uh, it's a bit different, but um, uh, we're going to the wiki and that's basically the homepage. And many of you have evidently seen it. Otherwise you, well, I'm not, well, you could have gotten the video link via my email, but um, it's also posted here. But I just want to give you a bit of a rundown how the structure of this is. Um, this basically should contain all the central information or pointers to relevant information, right? On the one hand, we have uh, references to um, the course directive, uh, as it's uh, written, the course rules. We go into that in a second. Following th this by contact information for teaching staff. Um, I probably should put Marsh here as well. I haven't done so yet, but he can do it also himself um, because then I don't need to guess his uh, Discord handle. Um, so you know how to get in touch with us in the widest sense. Uh, generally, I think uh, what we would uh, what we prefer for interaction is effectively to use the issue tracker first. And we get to that in a second. The issue tracker is the idea that um, the, uh, or the issue tracker has the idea that uh, we emulate behavior in real uh, software development, um, you know, companies or organizations in a wider sense. We actually post issues to either internally or externally, in our case, of course, internally to our uh, fellow fellow developers, and they can actually have a first go at that, in, including us as, as, as staff, as uh, to responding uh, to your questions, right? So, and we can also categorize questions more meaningfully and so on. What's the value of this? Well, the value of this is twofold. On the one hand, uh, you have a, a larger chance of getting a response because you have a wider forum that actually has a knowledge and experience in that very domain, because we're all kind of learning about this, this very area um, um, at the same time. Uh, but on the other hand, there's the reusability aspect, right? So when you have problems, you most likely are drawn to look at Stack Overflow, which is perfectly sensible. You can do that. The only thing you want to do is to be to learn about Stack Overflow and how to sensibly read it if you're looking for responses and try to understand what you're actually reading there and those responses. But um, the, the similar it similarly applies to issues, right? So you can identify, oh, does this issue also apply to me? So there's no point or no need to, let's say, uh, you know, lodge a similar issue again or um, um, you know, otherwise interact uh, with, with uh, anyone because it's documented already. So it's a great opportunity for having a bit of synergy effects in, um, in, 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 in uh, problem solving. Um, and that's something you use in practice as well. So we're kind of training this as well. So the alternative is to um, uh, get in touch, for example, via Discord. Um, and this will be a very practical reason um, because a lot of the support, I think, will run asynchronously, meaning, um, you know, you, you, you will post um, challenges, questions, either by a Discord, by direct message, or uh, via our um, Discord um, channel, which is called PROC2005 Cloud. So I encourage everyone to sign up. Here's the sign up link, by the way. Uh, it doesn't expire, so you can do it any time. And once you're on the server for the, the programming server, there's the Cloud2005 
PROC 2005 cloud channel um, that you can use for open interaction communication. Please have a look at this and um, consider using it, you know, for informal, for quick kind of information, akin to the chat that we're currently using for this session. That's something that can be ongoing and also be used for discussions and so on. But sometimes it's like a, a good way of getting in touch with you, like kind of last minute if things changes. I don't know, a room becomes unavailable or we need to move back into different teaching modes because of the corona thing or whatever, right? So we kind of quickly use this often for in formation but of course the default communication channel the official one would be email but it's um, a bit clunky to handle emails and um, it, it does not respond to the um, kind of professional use of available tools um, that would be commonly find but it's if it's a kind of a strictly personal issue and you kind of related to whatever organization administrative aspects of course then email is the way to go cool um, so much about communication i hope that makes somewhat sense uh, issue tracker Let's go into this uh, right now. So since we're onto it, so issue tracker is here. You find it here on the top left. Just click on issues, and you see, oh, there's no issues. That's slightly sad. So let's make issues. Um, generally, when you create issues, you want to keep um, be quite descriptive about the challenges that you have, right? So um, I don't know. So. Uh, <laughs> So I'm writing something that I uh, don't um, encourage. I'll get to that back in a second. Um, so, um, and um, basically then you need to have a somewhat descriptive or more detailed description, right? So uh, what you said, the perhaps configuration issues, but you basically write, write basically uh, uh, what, what, what your challenges are. It can, should be slightly more elaborate. But anyway, I'll... Um, um, Uh, well, it's not super instructive, so you want to have system information. But so that doesn't matter too much. There's a preview option you want to explore as well. But what I want to encourage you to look at is the labels one down here. That's the most important one. Um, because every issue should be labeled. Um, and I get to that why it's important. So we have different labels. Um, um, and you know, one of them is called announcement. The label announcement is generally used by us. Um, so by one of the teaching staff, if we want to share information, right? So. Um, um, we use this to yeah, make bigger announcement. And then the nice part in contrast to announcement on Blackboard is that uh, we can um, keep everything here in, in one place and of course also persistent. And it also makes it uh, easy for you to comment on anything. That's really nice because you basically when you launch an issue, you kind of have a trail of comments associated with this before the issue is possibly closed or, or kept open and so on. And the same for announcements. So it's very quick for us to respond. Then there's a uh, course related questions that you could have, right? So that relates to, let's say, I don't know, structure of the course more generally, platform related question. That is the one that we have here right now. That would be an example of a platform related question or programming related question. So it'd be more if you have issues with Golang and so on. And then there's this proactive sharing label. That is um, the, the, the idea is there, if you find a really good um, solution to a problem or um, you, you know, have a bit of a tutorial on uh, you know how to use um, um, go in a certain environment and so on uh, then you can do this with the proactive sharing label and that's really nice because it basically says that um, uh, have a look here um, there's something for you that is beyond the course and beyond the discussion it's not really a problem but a solution to a problem you may not even anticipate at this stage um, so that those are the few labels if you have uh, other ideas for labels let me know we introduced those but uh, it would be good to kind of keep those, manage those centrally. Otherwise you have possibly overlapping labels too much. Of course, courses can have, uh, they can have multiple labels, right? So if, if an issue um, kind of affects both platform and programming language, let's say, then you can label those accordingly. But ideally you wanna be, you know, have a sufficiently fine grained um, characterization of your issue um, that it's only uh, requires one label. So, and once you launch this, once you submit this issue, um, everyone should get notified. So, but the notification, there's a bit of a, um, a challenge there. So in order to get notified, you actually need to subscribe to labels. So if you don't subscribe to labels, you will not get notifications. Uh, and that's that's the main point. So uh, very important one. If you want to receive announcements, you kind of need to uh, subscribe to this. So what I encourage everyone to do, 
uh, once they get access, uh, and I make it very explicit in the wiki, uh, uh, it's in bold, um, just for reference, um, that you really go into labels, issues, labels, and subscribe to every single label once. Right, so once you're done with this, that's good. If I introduce a new label or if we find this necessary, uh, then I need to announce it and then usually using the announcement label and then please also subscribe to that so everyone is on board. Does it make somewhat sense? If not, feel free to post a question, comment. So it should be relatively straightforward. Um, cool. Yeah, so if you get into trouble, of course, uh, you, you, you get, get, get in touch with us um, and we'll sort it out. But that's the idea. So if anyone posts something, then everyone kind of sees it, like literally everyone. And that's that's the idea. So here is the uh, reminder um, for, for that particular um, aspect. Uh, the good question by uh, Jakob. Um, do you need to be subscribed to the issues um, to uh, subscribe to see issues or just notification? No, just for notification. You can see any issue at any time, but it just happens so that um, 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 you know that you, you just not get notified on a new issue and you look back, back into the issue tracker and find oh you know oh this issue is two weeks old right so uh, it would have been nice to you know get a notification on this. It just becomes very convenient to kind of tie everything up. So you get an email on this and you basically know ah cool you can click on the issue already and guides you back here into the uh, correct issue already. So it's it really goes very smooth and seamless uh, at, at that stage. If anyone has worked with GitHub before or contributed to an open source project, you will know the convenience that uh, is um, associated with this. Cool. Um, so since we are um, in the issue, uh, so we did the communication bit. So I think we're reasonably clear on Discord. Um, if you haven't tried out, is, is anyone unclear about what Discord is? is? Um, it's um, you know uh, uh, generally seen as a gamers chat, but we use it quite avidly in um, particular uh, yeah in, in most of our degrees here, um, um, master and bachelor degrees for interaction because of its ad hocness and so on, and the fact that we can host our own uh, servers and um, um, channels and so on. And pretty much every course, I believe, I say it with care, but nearly every course in any case has a corresponding channel, so it's useful to kind of think about. Okay. Um, other aspects. Um, there are, um, of course, the course consists of um, certain um, assignments, right? So generally, we uh, structure the course in terms of um, two assignments and one project. So this is a bit borrowed from the original structure of the course, and that's where it becomes a bit uh, 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 challenge in the sense in terms of scoping because this course is a bit more concise than the original cloud course which was a bit heavier and uh, um, it consists of two assignments generally that are kind of given so we give you a specification that you're coding against in the widest sense you should and I encourage to surprise us by having additional bells and whistles um, um, getting back to that as well and um, then we have a, a project at the end. And the project is generally or is group based. So the idea is that um, we have groups of three to five people um, that work together on a particular uh, uh, project that they kind of come up with ideally. But we can also come up with certain ideas. That's where Siamak comes in. He will help me uh, kind of um, um, kind of con conceive um, interesting uh, projects that we can use or APIs that we can exploit and so on. So. Um, stay tuned. That's something we're doing, I guess, yeah, about you know halfway into course and so on. Uh, it becomes more concrete to think about the project. But at any time um, now already, you can start thinking about okay, what would be a cool project I could possibly do as part of the cloud course? Still needs to be a project that others can participate in and um, um, that you you know kind of advertise then and hopefully people jump onto your project, which more than often uh, is the case actually. So uh, one question that I see in the chat is, are the assignments individual? Well, assignment one and two certainly are, right? So, um, but the project's not, the project is a group one. And the reason why they are individual, the first two ones is that um, uh, we want to be um, sure that you all have a kind of a, um, you know, solid understanding and a solid skill set before you go into the project so you can actually meaningfully contribute. Because in the past we were a bit more open about the nature of the assignments and also made them as group-based ones potentially. The risk there always was that uh, um, uh, not everyone had this kind of same skill level, right? Because, you know, someone is, is uh, perhaps more proficient in coding and then takes over a large chunk of those tasks. But those are very important. You'll also see by the uh, point weight that the assignments are actually quite heavy, right? Even the first one has considerable weight. Uh, 
uh, and you will need to uh, um, um, at least submit all of them anyway to pass the internal assessment. Doesn't necessarily mean that you necessarily get you know full points or more than half the points of all of them, but all want to be submitted because if you don't submit them, likely you're missing out on certain skills that will be necessary in the advanced um, stages. Um, the other aspect is um, that I just want to highlight, and I get back to that in a second when we talk about the rules associated with this. When we talk about assignment and we're talking to coding to specification, I often um, highlight you know what you're supposed to do with the assignment, but there's a certain uh, implied um, 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 skills that you want to bring in. We assume a level of professionalism that corresponds to a second year um, bachelor student, right? So, and when it comes to uh, software development that um, uh, also includes, for example, using versioning, right? Um, having um, sufficiently fine granular commits, for example, um, using issue trackers actually for your own benefit and so on, right? Using commenting, using uh, having a documentation in the form of a readme file at least and so on. So I got back to some of those professionalism points, but I just want to make clear that those are important aspects that we that that we don't uh, that you shouldn't expect us to specify but something you want to kind of you want to breathe this as a professional in a way right so anytime you attempt a project it's kind of something you want to do nevertheless i kind of made it explicit now but uh it's something uh that's, that's associated uh, and relevant Mayesh wants to say something please yeah, so i i just want to stress what christopher just said that it doesn't apply only to this course it applies across the board so in all courses from now on you're kind of expected to demonstrate certain professionalism and if the specifications say you have to achieve certain things it doesn't mean that you should not have tests or you should not have a readme file it kind of is default like all of you should think of properly structuring your code properly structuring your folders naming conventions you know if you give us uh, you know an assignment one which is called assignment one we know that assignment one you, you know think logically of how to communicate with other developers and with us mm. and how to structure things properly even though it is not specifically specified in the in the tasks themselves because it is kind of ex expected that you will do that uh, same with commit messages same with using the git uh, you know if you're using um, branches it's good if you're committing for small units of work, that's good. If you have one single commit where you committed the entire assignment, you know, that's really bad practice. Like, you know, what the hell? Like how, why would that happen, right? You know, developers don't work like this, like that. So um, think about it and kind of try to, to apply it in this course and across the board effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a request for break, so maybe we should have Um, yep, so that's right. So yeah, that's a very important point. I think this professionalism can't be uh, under under pronounced. It really needs to be highlighted again, time again. Cool. Um, all right. So um, yeah, so there's also um, an opportunity. I just want to um, um, highlight that. Oh, so there, there's there's more to that. Um, in terms, if we look at the uh, points and so on, all this kind of business, those are not necessarily points assignment for the assignment only. But the as I mentioned earlier, and that's also plays into professionalism. But on one of the um, principles of this course as well, we're doing peer review, and that is we have a bit of a well, we have a system for to manage some sort of peer review. It's not perfect, by far not perfect, but it kind of works. And that's um, uh, that's what we what we're going to use. And the idea is that you actually contribute in the review of your own um, uh, peer assignments, and you know provide some feedback. Very structured, of course. You'll be guided in this process, of uh, of course. Um, but the idea is really to to perform code review, be critical of your own work, but also others' work, and so on. But you also get points for those activities so they feed into your they're counted into your assignment mark as well so it's an element that is uh, um, uh, relevant as well so we expect you for example to do to um, do two peer reviews to get the um, corresponding um, um, mark for this but we can also do more and i get back back into the more thing because five points as you'll see if you make uh, if you sum up all the points we have 60 points for um out of 100 for internal assessments right so those are all practicals and so on and 40 points are the exam right so the exam as at the end it will be um in held likely held in spera 
Um, but uh, let's look at the 60 point uh, for now. And uh, you'll find that um, the project only consumes 25 points, for example, whereas uh, 30 points in combination are consumed by the two assignments. There are five additional points that are precisely for that purpose. And they are for all kinds of additional activity. That can be additional uh, reviews, if you do more than expected. It can also be for uh, proactive um, um, contribution to the issue tracker or, um, in fact, contributions to the issue tracker. So if you're responding to issues and so on, um, or if you have significant um, additional features in your projects that can also be kind of added, um, um, accounted for in those five points. So there's a bit of a flexibility there. Um, we actually played with the idea of to increase it even further to make it more flexible, but it's also a bit of a pain to kind of get the accounting about right. So we keep it at five points for now. Um, but I think this um, is something uh, to explore and to consider. So while we think that you should act based on your pro-social um, attitude, meaning your will to contribute to the cause, and I know many of you do in the past, I, uh, there's always a few individuals who are really going all in and kind of providing uh, way more than one would expect for a given cause. But um, the, the, the idea is also that you should get uh, some sort of uh, reward for uh, what you actually contribute uh, beyond just following the strict, uh, the strict instructions because you kind of need to be a bit of an independent thinker as well and, and feel more like that you're contributing to community rather than satisfying course requirements. Right? So, um, but again, the, the, the ideas uh, are outlined below and that's something we kind of uh, calculate at the end of the course. It was a bit of a nightmare, but nevertheless, we feel that it's uh, worth it, hopefully. Um, let's see. So that's the idea. Are there any other questions related to this? Just oh, a yeah. quick, uh, quick, quick comment that this uh, peer review and this yeah. looking at others people code is part of the learning. So you will yep. learn certain things because you you're doing that task. So uh, you know you do that by looking at somebody else's code in Stack Overflow, and it's the same in this course. Like you kind of teach each other and you learn from one another by you know reading somebody else's code. So that's just additional thing. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Um, I, yes, that's right. So it's very, uh, um, there's this learning element, which you do anyway, exactly. We reinforce it. So, okay. I think we should have a break. Uh, we have now spent an hour already on uh, um, quite, quite, quite swiftly and quickly. Um, is everyone comfortable with having a, a break until, is 10 minutes enough or what's your conventional preferred break? Probably six should... minutes. Sorry? Six minutes. Yeah, that's not helpful. Um, yes, uh, so just to respond to Ricard, so uh, first of all, um, we'll have a break until 11.25, but I'll just respond to um, the, the question that's uh, provided here. The peer review system means our rep uh, repos for assignment should be public. Yes, at least after submission, yes. Yeah, so that's a good point. So normally the repos are not public. Uh, you're working in isolation, you don't necessarily need to see each other code while you're working on it, then there is a deadline, then there is like a hard deadline, and then after the deadline, all the repos need to be public such that we can do peer review and we can do grading. So uh, while you're working on the assignments, yes, of course, you can uh, have it just for yourself, keep it private, uh, but the moment you submit, you have to open it up because uh, other people will have to have access to it. And it, it is in this course and in the other courses as well. It's the, it's the same. Um, is the visibility internal enough, Marius, for um, access? Yeah, internal is enough. Yeah, Internal could be enough, right? So internal yeah. means that it's only internal to our GitHub server, uh, GitLab server, that, but it means anyone who is on it, our all our students effectively see it, but no outsider. If that's a concern, that's also manageable there. Um, yeah, so, but that's that's basically um, uh, the idea there. And uh, here's the other aspect. Um, people are concerned about, you know, plagiarism, all that kind of business. There, there is, of course, this concern, but I also want to highlight when you're actually doing the assignments, you are allowed to collaborate, right? So, I mean, we, we are working to, in some instances, to specification, and there's only so many ways you can do certain things. So there's oftentimes not too much magic involved, especially in the earlier assignments. So if you are sitting together and working on something together, that is fine as well. So you may have had a glimpse at some other's code, right? Um, 
but um, the idea is there, can we kind of do, um, um, you still need to kind of independently kind of write this, comment this and kind of uh, uh, understand what you're actually doing, right? So um, so don't don't see this as a hard or fast silo exercise here. So even in the development process, we appreciate some interaction. Cool. All right, um, we'll have a uh, break. Um, and then I'll, there is an issue lodged. I'll have a look, but um, we have a break until 11.25. So I'll uh, keep quiet until then. Um, and then we continue there. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so far. I was muted, sorry for that. So we're back now. Um, regarding breaks uh, more generally, um, sometimes um, um, if, if we're in a narrative or talking so on, we lose a bit track of what the breaks are. Feel free to just post in the chat that it's time for a break. Generally, I uh, hope to time breaks um, uh, a bit, somewhat between um, um, the, let's say if, it, if we run starting course at 10.15, uh, I would aim for 11 to 11.15. 11 uh, so basically that was the far out boundary that we just had that I would consider. So a bit late, um, but generally I um, would want to see a break in, in the course as well. Again, it's just the matter of the narrative sometimes. So feel free to interact again. We need to shape the course. So you need to remind me sometimes as well. Um, all right, bring me a back up the chat in case there are any comments popping up. So um, one thing I just want to, uh, um, or two, two more things. So today is really largely infrastructural, it turns out. So I probably need to move the introduction to um, uh, with cloud uh, concepts a bit, bit later. But I just want to be clear where, uh, you know, what, what are the aspects that are kind of defined by um, the course directive, because this is kind of the the the, 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 the um, requirements that we need to satisfy as part of the course, right? So where within which we have a certain flexibility, but you know, um, we need to look at this. So um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we learn a bit about Linux architectural principles of cloud technology, um, security, um, the basics of operations we talk about. So we talk about some business models, applications uh, for cloud technology, of course, uh, something that is also uh, related to um, the project that you're hopefully doing. So because we hopefully see a bit of diversity in ideas there that you kind of push a bit for. Um, that's what we see the space for. Um, the uh, and of course you learn about REST. I mentioned that before already, and there are distinctive um, learning outcomes that we need to commit to and that we want to communicate. Right, so you need to have an understanding of the fundamentals of networking. And I know this is a bit of diverse because you again have you know various different backgrounds and so on. So we need to see that we get a shared understanding um, of the fundamentals in as far as they're relevant. Um, understand some cloud operations, the uh, requirements and challenges, you will definitely learn about this. Uh, differentiate between SaaS, PaaS and IIS, that's uh, completely sensible. Social and legal implications and also social here also implies economic uh, implications of cloud computing. Um, and get a feel of service um, um, portfolios offered by some cloud providers. So that's a bit challenging because we can't technically force you to sign up for them. Because in many instances, you need your credit card for this, which is not a clever idea. So we opt for um, uh, OpenStack for our, any of our assignments in the first instance so um, that we have a level playing field for everyone. You will be, of course, very familiar with REST. I'm very sure about this. And uh, associated transmission formats. So it's just um, JSON is the you know, way to go at this stage. So I think it's quite sensible. Um, if time permits, we can also talk about other formats. Um, it's generally a very nice discussion to be had. Um, cool. So then there are skills related to it, meaning uh, aspects that you're actually evaluating or uh, performing, discussing, and so on. Um, and um, largely focus, of course, that you are able to talk about SaaS, PaaS, and IIS, design RESTful APIs, um, conceptualize more comprehensive cloud-based solutions. So, you know, a set of APIs, for example, um, that, that kind of m m create a service in the widest sense or an added value, in a, um, more importantly. And um, that you're looking uh, able to look into security. I'm not suggesting that you are, have a comprehensive background afterwards, um, but uh, at least that you're sensitive to um, issues that may arise uh, in particular settings. Um, 
And deployment is, of course, very, very important. You will certainly program against third-party APIs. That's one of the main points of this course, because cloud computing is also to capitalize on an ecosystem. The fact that there are so many services out there, why can't we use this to actually build our service on top of it, right? So that's the value, general value. Um, general competence, we expect you to improve your co programming abilities. I'm very sure that this will happen. I mean, um, Marsh will uh, teach, about, uh, teach Golang and will reinforce it throughout the course. Um, and that you are more at the intersection or can be able uh, to operate the intersection between programming and operations, right? So we're not just looking at the programming perspective. It's also important to get a bit of an impression or understanding what it means to actually deploy such services um, as well. And then more general um, um, understanding on the uh, social, ethical, um, and, and the implications of cloud technologies. Something we'll touch on as well. Just to be clear, those are the aspects that we're talking about as part of this course. Uh, the flexibility is to some extent how we achieve it. Um, but this is publicly available, right? So there's no secrets there. Um, the other thing I just want to briefly talk about, because it has been an issue in the past, and it's probably more worthwhile to be clear, even though it sounds harsh, but to be clear about this now rather than later, um, are the rules for the course um, in, in, in many, many instances. So uh, we set this up. This has been built over years of experience uh, and interaction with um, um, you know uncertainties and so on. So I just want to be really clear about um, why we do certain things um, and what we expect from you and uh, what you can expect from us as well. Uh, so the official language is English mostly because we are internationals, but we also, more importantly, we have a lot of internationals uh, as part of our um, students. So this is actually a fairly international course, specifically this one here. Um, we we expect everyone to be on the programming Discord. Again, the invite link is here, so just, just join. Um, and again, you find a wide range of different courses there, uh, pretty much all of our courses, uh, but specifically ours here, that's of course relevant. We also expect everyone to be on GitLab. Um, if that hasn't happened yet, please go ahead. I know there are some hiccups here and there, and for many of the reasons, for example, the reasons Marish mentioned earlier, no, no harm there, we'll figure it out. Uh, just ensure that you uh, make an effort to get onto this environment because you have access to all this information immediately then. Um, we expect regular work by students that they commit to the course and kind of um, um, look, uh, review and so on, um, of course. But I think this is a general understanding. I wouldn't put particular emphasis on this, but probably what's more important is the aspect that we mentioned earlier that's really important to uh, entrench professionalism. See yourself as a professional. Here's also a link that motivates it a bit further. Uh, about uh, good practices in software engineering. And this is really the point, right? Because you're not, um, the, the purpose of the course is not to make you a Golang developer. The purpose of this course is to make you a, um, you know, um, ge a better general developer in a wider sense, uh, and um, specifically software developer, irrespective of the programming language. And then that's where all those professionalism aspects come in. Uh, there are, some of them are explicitly highlighted here, but again, um, just bear those in mind. So um, here it's very clear about collaboration. We had this question often in the past, you know, how much collaboration is permissible and so on, and uh, or what resources can you actually use? And we are actually fairly, um, so uh, we actually fairly, uh, fairly kind of um, um, flexible, I guess. But um, the idea is that we allow for collaboration. Uh, we allow the open use of the internet, of course. I mean, we're not in a um, 20th century anymore, I guess. Uh, so you're free to use the internet where you can. But the important thing is there, that's mentioned further below, is that you um, um, indicate this clearly, right? If you take something from Stack Overflow, just be clear about it. Um, even you know, and ensure that you understand it. That's probably more important. And I bet Marish will talk more about it in 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 the context of his um, um, introduction to 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 Golang more generally. Um, use issue tracker and Discord openly, so no harm there. I mean, you know, if someone gives you substantive feedback and actually fixes bugs, code, whatever else for you, sure, perfectly fine, no harm there. Um, you can use, you know, other resources of whatever kind of nature, and of course, even books. I'm not sure if anyone still knows those things, but they are, they exist. Um, so if you find anything that you deem relevant, go for it. Um, 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 for the course. So generally the course is not so much book-based here, but really more, uh, we're building on, largely on, on online resources, to be honest. Um, so, um, yeah, okay. We had in the past cases of uh, plagiarism. We don't really want, 
want to reinforce, but I don't think it should necessarily be a problem. It's really about like if you copy code the obvious one, right? So or um, if 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 uh, there's a wrong uh, attribution, for example, and so on. Uh, or in worst case, if you actually outsource your actual assignments to external people, meaning they wrote the code, you're submitting it, and we figure this out somehow. That's not a good idea. Generally, you want to avoid this. Also, I, I don't like this rule at all because um, it kind of defeats the idea of skill development. Do you want to improve your skill set, right? It's not just pass the course. That should be, I think, the, the main point here. So regarding lectures, uh, we generally uh, uh, encourage students to participate in uh, lectures, but we don't require you, right? You're grown-ups, um, you're, you're tertiary students, so you have this choice, but be aware that you may miss out because you don't have this interactivity, right? So we can't make up for this interactivity offline then afterwards if you have very distinctive questions and so on. So there is merits to actually participating. Uh, in the course. Uh, you can also come and leave early and so on, all this kind of stuff. So we're, we're kind of flexible on this. I'm not I'm not big on monitoring. If other courses do that, they may well, but I don't really. Um, so, but we assume a certain level of responsibility that you assume, uh, have, yeah. Cool. Uh, we can stream, we, we will attempt to stream all lectures. Well, in those times, I guess it's a mandatory to, for a lecture to come about. The reason is why we claim we make an effort is that sometimes there are technological challenges, right? I don't know, you name it. Recording doesn't work for a to click the button. Um, uh, you know, YouTube is offline. Usually we use YouTube for streaming, for example, and so on. So there may be issues. And sometimes there may also be delays based on setup issues. You, you never know. There are certain uncertainties you want to kind of uh, uh, be prepared for. Cool. Um, there's a lot of sensible responsibility on the students, just to be clear about. Um, they are, in many respects, uh, motivational, but they should um, they give you a clear understanding what we ex we we we, we um, see a student potentially doing as part of the course, right? So you want to engage in self-study, kind of going beyond the course and uh, learning, asking questions, uh, driving discussions. Uh, perhaps even pushing uh, new ideas into the course. I mentioned the issues where you can proactively uh, share links, for example, to interesting resources or even solutions to problems and so on, or code, if you like. Uh, and we also expect you to do peer reviews and participate in um, the sessions where we're sensible. Anyway, that's all the kind of general stuff. I don't think there's anything that's remotely um, contentious. So we we'll leave at any time. That's right, that applies to practical sessions. Same there, we can be flexible teaching staff may or may not be present. So it may also mean that those sessions are asynchronous. And in this time, it's probably more often than not because uh, it may be more, make more sense to lodge an issue about your problem and then see it solved uh, rather than awaiting the next session, you know, during which we can address it. So um, please use the issue tracker and Discord for this. It's, it's really good. And it's also good for documentation. So it's not just a um, um, question then it's forgotten, but actually there's value for keeping this information for everyone else. Group work. Uh, group work is a tricky one. Uh, I'll probably iter reiterate over this later in the semester, but it's important to highlight it now. Group sizes we expect are three to five people, generally, or recommended. There are exceptions. You can even go uh, rogue. <laughs> no, that's, I didn't say that. Um, you, 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 you can go solo, right? If you, if you have to, we don't think it's a good idea, but sometimes it is sensible if we are, for example, have a remote participant only, um, or if you need larger groups because you want to produce something more substantive or bigger, also fine just tell us and let us know and then we'll you know see if that makes sense from our perspective and also corresponds to the scope because that's the challenge um, that you're facing throughout your degree is it's always to identify assignments uh, or, or solve for assignments um, in, in correspondence to their scope for your bachelor thesis and pretty much your main challenge will be to have a um, you know, workload that corresponds to the weight of a bachelor in a wider sense. And that's the same here. That's why we're so cautious about the group sizes. So groups must have a group leader. That's the idea. Uh, and this group leader is in a large uh, instances responsible for actually running the group, right? So organizing meeting, organizing group, uh, uh, dealing with some sort of uh, um, uh, challenges within the group also has the liberty to set up rules for the group. So there's a certain uh, um, a governance aspect that's related to it. Um, and But the leader, of course, has then also rights there and it can issue warnings and uh, organize voting sessions and so on. And uh, we, based on past experiences, especially in, 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 in two large groups, that's why we reduced the group size considerably, um, it is that we um, 
allow um, students possibly to be removed from a group, for example, if they don't show up for, I don't know, um, two or three meetings, I don't know, or whatever your conditions are, because you set up those rules. You can also drag through uh, a weak performance, but probably you don't want to necessarily do that. But if someone drops off the planet, you probably don't want this individual to get the group mark in the end. Um, so that's that's an important point. This individual then would need to kind of find another group and kind of apply. It's not a default delegation to another group. So if no one sees fit or has space, that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, we'll certainly try our best in the past. We had had to resort to sometimes let those individuals do their own projects. And that's usually not a better outcome than staying actually in a group and contributing meaningfully. So we want to avoid free riding, but to be very clear about this. Um, Everyone who's in a group should, should do a substantive contribution. And of course, not everyone can do the same contribution by the very nature of the game, but but it's very important uh, to us. And uh, if the group leader doesn't know what to do anymore, then it's time to get in touch with us and we solve the problem. Uh, so there's a bit of a staged elevation in case uh, things go um, south. Um, yeah, cool. So um, we have a bit of a, uh, yeah, on deadlines. So certain internal deadlines, um, there are, um, we have two types of deadlines that we sometimes use. We have sometimes more like um, softer deadlines that we generally aim for. And then we have really hard, hard, hard deadlines that we can't uh, really extend anymore. Um, and this this sometimes depends on external circumstances, but um, we, um, we we generally want to see you aiming for specific deadlines. But we had examples, like if I give you one, uh, where a particular, um, service did not run over a particular time frame of the um, course. So suddenly we felt ourselves, felt it was only sensible to extend the necessary deadline because it wouldn't make sense to students to, uh, uh, you know, compensate for uh, an external service being offline. Again, that's part of the cloud challenge here that we actually explicitly require and rely on you to kind of use external services, right? So um, that's something to be uh, be mindful of. Cool. Um, Anonymity and privacy, important point. Um, the, the the idea is that the uh, lectures are streamed if everyone agrees. I think we have some sort of consensus right now that uh, um, those are shared. Um, so I will do that afterwards and provide the link also in the, I'll show you where later in the main wiki. So you can also look at the playlist and recall uh, what we talked about, right? So. Um, you guys are already doing a great job. If you uh, want to ins ensure privacy, uh, that means basically switch on off your camera and your microphone uh, if you want to remain off stream and you can use the chat as you do. However, I kind of like a bit of interactivity as well in, in a vocal form. So if, you, if you're comfortable with this, I would also encourage you to speak up uh, if we have questions or so on, just to have a bit of a... Um, uh, not just my monotonous voice, but someone else perhaps speaking up. Because usually in lectures in a live setting, and hopefully we get to that uh, later in the semester, uh, we have a bit more of an interactive forum, which just um, is also more invigorating for the lecturer itself. Otherwise, I feel myself talking to a to a voice sometimes. So um, so that's made more before your lecturer's mental well-being than for yours in many instances. Oh, there's a student who wants to talk. Um, unfortunately, I can't say no. So please go for it, Marge. So uh, just a comment to that. Um, yeah. it, it is really, really hard to give lectures to a microphone and camera without seeing you guys. And I like uh, some of you I never seen before ever because you are kind of the, the new stream of students who uh, we don't know personally yet. Um, so, you know, it, it is actually quite hard to be on that side of the, of the room and not seeing anybody and talking for two hours to, you know, to a wall. Um, so uh, those of you who are kind of comfortable, uh, we do appreciate if you keep, yeah, great, Jason, if you do keep your cameras on and kind of uh, show yourself up, because then it, it kind of helps to have a bit of a more personal experience. Uh, we don't enforce it, we don't require that, of course, but it, it does help the lecturer to actually be motivated and kind of uh, doing the job. So just kind of a comment on that. Yeah, well, it's by no means a requirement. There's also other constraints such as connectivity sometimes, right? So if there's too much uh, things going on, then it wouldn't make sense to have, let's say, uh, what is it, 70 people switch on their cameras. Uh, it, it can so work in certain instances, but may not be good for everyone's internet connection. So we need to bear in mind those uh, effects of scaling in the cloud <laughs> realm uh, in as far as related to Zoom. So yeah, cool. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. 
what other aspect do I want to highlight? Um, yes, I mean, tradition in class settings, we had a bit of an off, off, off topic uh, or off the record kind of uh, talk. So aspects that are more one to one. I think we need to offline uh, relay this for now to Discord interaction or email communication if there's, you know, one to one needs uh, in a way. Cool. Um, in the past, uh, when we had practical sessions in the classical physical form, which we uh, evidently don't have for a foreseeable time, but rather, uh, you know, by negotiation, um, in, in or by 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 yeah, by by negotiation, the wise by getting in touch in the first place, um, then uh, we did not record those sessions for privacy reasons uh, generally, and um, that's the same here effectively. Um, as well, unless there's, for example, a tutorial, let's say, Marsh doing crazy live coding, uh, which is not considered part of, um, you know, the core lecture content, then this would possibly be recorded and provided, right? Because it has this 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 um, um, learning value. Um, but it's about, and that may also respond to a particular student's problem, right? So in a way, cool. All right. Uh, last thing, we need to have a class representative, or in fact, a group of them, right? So we need to have our evaluation group as usual. And um, the um, representative can then form a group. But I'm indifferent about the notion of the representative or the outright the group. So if anyone feels uh, like volunteering, that would be uh, great. The new process for this, I'm not sure if you guys had had the pleasure. Um, it's actually done via the um, new evaluation um, um, tool. Uh, let's see if that's, I'm not sure if it's final. Um, I'm not sure if it's entirely final at this stage, uh, the evaluation portal, because they have beta it last semester. I'm not sure how went that, uh, well that went, but that's basically the means by which it's going to be submitted, uh, I guess. You find it via INSEA as well, but we can talk about it when we get to that point. Um, cool. Um, so that's an important one, but whenever you, you feel, um, you, ah, right, um, before I forget, so those are the main rules uh, effectively that we have set up and they're referenced here, right? And um, here's the thing. One of the deals is when you add you and make you members to this thing, you have editing rights for the wiki, including the homepage. So, um, I mean, you know, so uh, we trust you uh, in many respects that you're not disruptive. We never had issues with this. So that's why we will continue this policy because we want you, it to be somewhat interactive. Of course, theoretically, you could change assignments and all that kind of jazz, but you firstly wouldn't want to. Second of all, there's a page history. So we know who <laughs> did what anyway. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily help you. So, um, but but the idea is if you, you know, find typos or uh whatever else or um, uh, want to you know add modifications of i don't know of other nature that are more like um you know stylistic or whatever else then it's perfectly fine and the same applies for example for the reference group when we appoint a reference group you can add yourself to that um by editing the wiki that's right so those are the points i just wanted to make a lot of talking on my side questions I haven't quite looked at the chat, but I probably need to make up for that. I'm so glad I have so much support here because uh, both my yeah, There was a question about assignments. Uh, uh, they will come probably mid-February or late February. The Golang assignments, non-assignments, we, we just have some exercises will come as soon as we start Golang. Um, one note on the editing wiki and so on. Um, mm -hmm. We sometimes make errors, like we do say something that is not true, or you know, you will find out that you know something can be done better. Then, by all means, pose an issue and and tell us, right? So, um, make uh, po point to, to problems that are kind of um, that that you find out. Th th those things will play in your favor. You will get kind of a get better grade if you spot errors, like in uh, resources or in books or in things. Uh, and contribute uh, corrections. So th this is something, those additional five points, which uh, Christopher was talking about, that will kind of be in your favor. So uh, never hesitate to say, oh yeah, I don't think this is right. Uh, sometimes you might not be right, but there is no punishment. <laughs> if you point to something that turns out that uh, it was actually originally correct, but uh, you know, th sometimes there are you know, obvious uh, issues or ob obvious things. Uh, libraries change, language changes, you know, things move forward. Definitely. Uh, we don't know everything. Like we might be telling you something that you say, ah, oh, wait a minute, you know, there is this new thing. And it's like, oh yeah. And so, you know, always do that. Like don't, don't wait. 
Yeah. We we even pushed this further. We have had it in the past um, that we have students. I mean, our, again, our student body is rather mixed, and uh, I hope we can conclude this uh, and learn more about you in a second. But um, the, the 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 idea was we had students that are actually quite mature and had working experience of years of working experience. And in this instance, we even invited them to actually talk about certain aspects as well, right? So they can actually give a bit of an introduction about cloud infrastructure that we don't touch up on the course, or only very limited, and they actually give a deeper insight. So if anyone of you has has such an experience or, uh, or, or is willing to share this is great then we can actually you know um, kind of embed this somewhere in in the course you know it may just be a few minutes of introduction or if you feel that it's more extensive we can also make that happen uh, so feel free and forthcoming there um, cool all right so um, the um, yep. So I think those are the, the, the main points I want to highlight. Some, so one of the sections that can be built up and is right now kind of really um, brief is, of course, the resource section. So you get reference to, you know, the languages and the tools we are largely going to use. Um, for Golang, generally, we go with the latest stable version, right, Marish? Do you agree with this? I mean, that's a certain call you can make, but don't don't push us into uh, no. the alpha, alpha and beta area. <laughs> No, no, no. So we, we're going to use uh, uh, 1.15.6 and we're going to stick to it, even if there will be changes uh, to like, you know, during the course, it may happen that Golang 2 happens. OK, uh, we will not change. So for the duration of the semester, we're sticking to 1.15. Mm. Cool. So, um, yep. All right. Um, there are some comments on software setup. I posted uh, some some kind of two uh, brief tutorials on how to do setup for uh, VirtualBox and Linux. And even there, you can edit them as well. If I, if you see value in making them come more concrete, more refined, and so on, there's a good opportunity there. There's also uh, an introduction about uns installing Golang and associated IDEs uh, or either of them really on on your machine. Um, heads up to Marius. I'm not sure if you have seen that one, but uh, VS Code and uh, Golang seem to be the IDEs we probably at least want to uh, support or be aware of as part of the course. I know some some of you may go beyond and uh, you know do it in Vim and so on, but that's not necessarily something we can support in all instances. Uh, but we allow development both on Windows 10 uh, or ideally or Ubuntu, you know, some LTS version, 18.04 or 20.04, or uh, whatever it may be. The instructions provided here are for 20.04 because it uses the latest snap packages. I'm not sure what's the situation on 18.04 right now. Meaning uh, when I say 18.04, it's a previous version from 28, from April 2018 uh, of Ubuntu. And we're now referencing the one from 2020 April, which is an LTS version. LTS stands for long-term support. Those are the versions of Ubuntu that are supported in long-term by Canonical, and uh, you are encouraged to use those, especially for cloud-based applications, because you rely on support uh, for that particular purpose. So please have a look at, if you haven't already, have a look at those tutorials and um, uh, uh, try to 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 work to those. And if you have issues, post issue. Uh, if you should with this, please post issues here. Then we can see if we can. Uh, alleviate this and if you find there's something odd or unanswered or unclear in this descri uh, description um, because again we write them from our perspective then feel free to refine them because usually we need to kind of rewrite those every time again because things change IDEs change and you know little things change for example the go installation moved from uh, was uh, much more manual before and now with snap is quite a bit different and so on so there may be experiences that you guys have guys have that we haven't seen yet again we are in the course <laughs> in this together if you like um, but um, that I just want to highlight um, that point at the bottom, you'll find an incremental build up on the wiki again uh, of the lectures. So for every week, there will be lectures, lecture slides. The lecture slides will be linked under the title of the, call, uh, the this particular lecture. Um, there will be a recorded lecture. There will be a link to a playlist that you can find, and you'll find all lectures there. Uh, and the link here is the, the current one we'll be currently using uh, is posted here as well. Um, any updates will, of course, also incur here. So th this is a dynamic. This is kind of a living living thing um, um, that will um, further elaborate on. OK, I spent way more time on this than I wanted, admittedly, but I think it was for the better uh, to get some clarity. Before we wrap up, I want to learn slightly bit more about you. Um, and the reason is mostly to prepare for the upcoming sessions, to what extent we need to go deep or not in certain aspects. For example, uh, as, as you saw before, one of the objectives uh, or what necessities rather than objectives of the course is to ensure that everyone is on top of things when it comes to Linux, to be able to navigate Linux with permissions and all what it is and all that kind of jazz. 
So um, the, the idea is basically there, and some people starting already before I introduce it, thank you, um, to, to indicate which study program you're in and at certain other experiences that are associated with this. So um, can you see, oh God, um, can you see that code, uh, the Menti code on top, anyone? Yes, we can see it. Cool. Uh, because I, I, it's obscured here in my, my own thing. But I just want to see what the distribution is between different students uh, to see what, you know, uh, wh whom we are dealing with, in, in fact, and that is in practice, because you may be signed up, but not everyone who signed up shows up uh, regularly. So I think we get a sensible distribution that is two thirds, one thirds distribution between uh, BPROC on the one hand and uh, BData um, on the other. We have one uh, uh, DICSEC student, that's great as well, yes. Um, it would be interesting to learn about the other. Uh, other could mean international students, I think, right? So that's probably not an unrealistic assumption. But if there's another distinctive degree uh, you want to share, whoever you are, feel free to go though. Exchange student. What's your what's your kind of study program if you would like to share? Again, no obligation, please. Just to get a bit of a feeling of your background. because uh, Joaf is uh, joining us for this semester. I hope we pronounce it correctly. Software engineering, beautiful. Okay, we'll love that, yes. Um, yeah, you fit right in. Um, yeah, perfect, cool. All right, so it's, it's yeah, they're, they're, they're um, uh, slowly chasing up. I think we have a good, seemingly uh, somewhat representative overview, I guess. Gives me a good feel that we are, uh, yeah, there is, um, I guess, I reckon, uh, what is it? Three fifths, I guess, in favor of BPROC and then BData. So we have a very much a main catchment here that's centered around you guys. Thanks very much. That's helpful, actually. Um, so talking about Linux, because, uh, you know, I will do a bit of an introduction, of course, um, about uh, uh, Linux in any case. The question is, how deep do we need to go, right? So some of you, I know that in a new program, BPROC in particular, uh, there is a Linux component embedded in the first year, but you know that we haven't had any experience with this because it's new as well. So you want to be really clear about what this uh, what this uh, means. And uh, I'm not sure about the B data course. Do you guys have any sort of uh, Linux experience? Has a small comment. Okay, cool. Thanks, Sim. That's 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 helpful. Um, could you highlight some of the, or perhaps in an issue, uh, if you wanted to highlight some of the features they have talked about or point me to the course? Sorry for not uh, taking note of this. I hadn't seen it before. Um, because that would be important to see how much we need to push it in terms of the things. I mean, the aspects I'm thinking about is basic navigation in the uh, command line, uh, idea, concept of path, profiles, um, permissions, um, uh, software installation um, on, on uh, particular distributions, um, file management, the widest sense, editing files, um, running programs, um, and um, akin to that, um, and then, you know, eventually building on this, uh, deploying Docker containers and so on, but that's something that will come incrementally. Okay, those those concepts were were covered. Um, I never let's find that a lot of people indicate themselves as low in Linux, so into to see what we, what we can make of this. Probably do a bit of an um, uh, inquiry in the beginning and then uh, go so, uh, go through aspects that are a bit softer amongst individuals. Um, yeah, we also talk a bit about Linux more general, uh, what, you know, background and concepts, different forms of distributions and so on. That's probably could be of some interest to, to individuals, um, but you can stop me right there. So we hold that session somewhat more interactively then. Cool, but I think I have a good overview here. So everyone has some Linux experience, which is really great. Um, and um, yep, cool. So the, there are some high-performing uh, or hi, hi, students with high Linux experience. I assume that's not so much based on courses, but rather based on your personal interest and engagement, right? Yeah, okay. So we usually have those uh, uh, um, um, few candidates that actually have really entrenched experience. I encourage you to kind of really contribute, especially when issues uh, related to Linux or questions come, because you may have actually more entrenched experience than, than some of us, in fact, right? So for, for example, myself, I used to use Linux a lot on as my primary platform, but I have stopped doing that. And mostly it's the reason compatibility with my environment being in ATU, which is a very much Microsoft -y. So, um, which is sometimes a pain and a disadvantage, I think, but uh, it's just, you know, your working life and it will be in the future as well. You kind of need to look what your ecosystem is and how you best integrate with this. There are some uh, people that use Mac, for example, Marish is one of them. Um, so if there are Mac issues that he may also be, uh, you know, um, be, be 
able to point to some issues. That said, that should not uh, affect us. The course is really like centered around Windows and Linux uh, because we have most expertise there. So cool. All right, um, so thank you very much. Um, I will also uh, save those results here because I think that could be quite valuable to kind of come back to eventually. If you have Linux experience, which distributions have you seen or have experience with? Um, you can only tick one, um, so it's a bit of a pity. So pick the one that you want to highlight specifically, either have most experiences or that you feel is most remote and you just want to ensure that we have a nice distribution. Okay, cool. So it seems to be very Ubuntu heavy. So I assume that has been used in coursework then. So we are right on track. It, it kind of makes sense to commit to this anyway, because it's at least 25% of the market share anyway in a Linux world, um, if not higher. I think there's some, some competition in the meantime from others, but it's Ubuntu. It is really the thing that everyone is acquainted with, I suspect. And Debian is largely can be subsumed into Ubuntu as well to some extent still building up but i think we have a clear understanding that this is kind of the environment what's the other linux that someone has experience with just for the sake of perusal uh of, of just to get a feel if the person would like to share All right, I think, anyway, uh, I think there will not be a tragic change anymore. Uh, unlike the US elect ele elections, we don't need to wait to the end to find, have the final count. I think Ubuntu is the one that has won in this particular uh, distribution. So, uh, cool, thank you. Um, cool. Um, which programming languages are you familiar with? Just, yeah, exactly, blow me away, us away, that is. Because that's really helpful for, um, you know, knowing where you're coming from. And if you don't have any programming experience, also highlight this, but just write typing out non, for example, which is uh, really a good idea. So Java is heavy, Python, CPP, C++, uh, yeah, they can be subsumed. So C++ is pronounced. JavaScript, oh yeah, okay. Um, this is standard of Python, Java and JavaScript and C++, I think here. Yeah, that seems to be the realm, I guess. Rust. Okay. Manish, did you talk about Rust already? Or no, that must be outside, right? Or, of we, did, we did talk about Haskell and Rust a little bit, but we haven't started yet. So. Let me guess, you contributed to the Menti uh, input, right? <laughs> no. Yes, you did. And you're not a student, so treat this as <laughs> sanctioning. If I were group leader, you would be out slowly. No, yellow card, I guess. Um, all right, so JavaScript, C++, Python, Java. Um, Okay, cool. I think we know where you're coming from, right? So is that is that helpful? That's probably also helpful for you, Myers, right? So kind of to yeah. frame to frame yeah. the the introduction bits because every one of us, you know, we know we're going towards Golang. It's just good to get the feel. Cool. Uh, running out of time, but I have a few more questions. If you allow me to, if you have to uh, run, please run. No worries there. I think we can still get a good catchment. Uh, so Java, CPSP, uh, JavaScript, and Python. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you'll be at home because then you have a good foundation for. Uh, Golang, especially C++ and Java people will be feeling very much comfortable with this. Uh, IDEs, just give me the same feel about IDEs that you know or don't know. If there's none, just type out none. So we know also that people don't have any priors, which you know is important for us. So we talk about this quite a bit differently. Which IDEs are you talking about, Mayesh, in your course? Vim. <laughs> Not helpful. But you also. Well, about... I, I did. I did talk about IntelliJ. I talked about Visual Studio Code, and uh, yeah, of course, Vim too. But uh, yeah, I, we we quite flexible. Like yeah, you know. that's the main point, right? I think we shouldn't be um, swayed necessarily no. by what the lecture used, but actually, what's more uh, convenient. I mean, Vim has has has, has certain features and certain uh, um, um, uh, strengths, and you are and more than encouraged to use it. It's just so that we may not be able to support, at least in the context of the. Cloud course, but possibly in the context of the programming course then. Uh, but again, that's a bit unfair because not all of you are in the programming course. That would be misleading. So I don't think we should uh, push this too far. But um, um, so um, the plan is to use VS Code since it's very popular in the meantime. Oh, code block sublime. Wow, cool. Everything. Notepad. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> um, 
and uh, VS Code uh, and IntelliJ, or rather Go Land, with, which is a um, derivative of uh, IntelliJ in the first place. So everyone who's comfortable with IntelliJ will be very comfortable with Go Land as well. Um, and uh, I hope you have the NTNU license for IntelliJ. You should have, right? You get a free license, yeah. and you also get then free Go Land access as well. Uh, I think I, I indicated this in my instructions in the wiki as well, if you haven't already. Cool, BlueJ as well, nice, yes. Very nice overview, thank you very much. The Golang online sandbox, cool. <laughs> that's that, yeah, true, that's actually not a not a bad point there. That's true, really, and yeah. It, someone, it is very useful, yeah. Yeah, for mucking around and playing those those repels, there are those those interactive um, yeah, environments, they're actually quite helpful, cool. Um, Okay, so uh, or not okay? Yeah, some some comments. Blue Jay is not okay. That's uh, just more like a uh, emotion of observing uh, something I didn't expect. Um, cool. All right, cool. Believe it. Uh, Visual Studio, of course. Uh, well, VS Code. I think you're close there. Uh, it's just we don't use uh, C sharp, so having a bit more of a generic take on it. Um, plus open source. Um, cool. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, last one is there. Ah, yeah. What do you intend to learn in this course? So then I kind of primed you a bit, but you don't need to follow that idea. But the idea is a bit more to, to um, kind of um, seed uh, directions we want to take. Yeah, and try to be specific, somewhat specific. Um, yeah, stuff is good. I mean, that's the probably more generic one. If you were to define an ontology of uh anything it would be stuff at the thing right at the top right so a thing at the top followed by stuff ethics yeah cool yeah magic someone is into magic here's the thing um i personally think programming is not about magic but myers may divert may have a different view there so and he can this uh clarify or confuse you even further um yeah but if we can we'll do some magic whoa 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 okay i really need to save that word cloud and look at it carefully because that is one lot of ideas. I think we have a good question here. Which which is? Uh, what the cloud is. Ah, what the cloud is. That's right. Yes. What is the cloud? That's right. Uh, yes. And I hope we get closer to that uh, in uh, the upcoming session. That's right. Computer wizardry. Oh, scary. Yeah. Stu machine milieu. So a uh, large data um, uh, center kind of environments, I guess. Um, yep, so we'll see how far we get there realistically, because that's something we uh, often leave more to our operations friends in EEC, uh, which are actually running a course called Infrastructure as Code, for example. And um, yeah, I think, I'm not sure what the current name is of that course, but that's the idea that where everything is tied up, uh, or, you know, entire data center is scripted up. Um, I'm not sure in how far we, we, we get to that extent. Deployment automation is some concurrency, interesting. Um, Marsh, yeah, that is something that Golang actually explicitly covers, so we that's not a big deal. Best practices, uh, ski, yeah, cloud again, yes, right. Um, having fun, hopefully, you do. That's part of the, the skill development bit, right? When you actually do the <laughs> I couldn't defeating spaghetti code, that's a good one. <laughs> this is, I think, a very shared objective and speaks to the professionalism uh, requirement that we set out, so that's great. Uh, we do that. Where my data goes. That's right. Cool. Yes. So, so we are well over time. Anyone is free to leave. I'll, what I will do, I'll just uh, collect the uh, the the rest um, um, of this, and of course, post this word class as well, so you have your overview as well, so you don't need to um, uh, commit if you have other uh, obligations to attend to. And of course, I'll upload the video afterwards as well. But yeah, that looks like a really beautiful word cloud with the essential uh, term at the center, which is, uh, well, lucky me, I guess. Uh, if it was something else, then we should be concerned, shouldn't we? Um, lightning in a box. Crypto, okay. Um, yeah, but okay. I mean, uh, uh, Maj, where you see opportunity, need, or fit, uh, you can also take over some of those aspects, right? So, or address some of those aspects. Uh, perhaps they can inspire some of the uh, discussions that maybe had, because um, um, you know, the crypto aspects is certainly your domain. Or let's say, in a wider sense, encryption, in as far as relevant for the cloud, is also your uh, domain. Or the relationship to um, you know, possibly blockchain technology. In fact, if we wanted to, 
uh, we could have a related talk uh, either uh, perhaps later in the course or something uh, that could um, uh, pick up on so some of the issues you wanted to. Or yeah, we could do that. We wanted to. But anyway, let's let's make this a bit future music because that would be shooting ahead too far right now. Cool. All right. I think we'll leave it at this. I got a lot of feedback. Um, certainly more than I expected. So it's really great. Uh, but it's already uh, really good in driving us so we know which direction to take and kind of what to prepare us for. Cool. Are there any other questions or comments that you want to uh, raise just now? You're, of course, free to do that later on via issue tracker or um, we need a Discord. Ah, yeah. Who closes issues? Yes. Um, very good. That's a very good question you're asking. Um, so I think a, a sensible... Um, move is basically to um generally i would argue that the person who has to ask the question should also be in the position to argue when the question is sufficiently responded to that that doesn't hold in all cases but if it's a very specific question you will know when you feel that you it provided necessary solution right in some instances it may uh, in many instances it may also be us that uh, you know if it's more like a a distinctive question you want to have a response to, not so much a problem solving one, then we may feel inclined to just close the issues. Um, yeah, so but we're not hard and fast on this, uh, admittedly, or haven't been in the past, because oftentimes we leave announcements open. Um, so they're also seen more visibly afterwards, even though they are not like the latest announcement anymore. But I think we should make sense of practice out of it to kind of close those as well and arise. But yeah. it's important for you students then also to look at close issues if you want to learn something, because some of the magic is then suddenly hidden there, right? Maish, yeah. I heard you. Yeah, so we, we typically kind of let the issuer close the issue. So you 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 you, you have that. Uh, some issues, as uh, Christopher said, we closed because they are not relevant anymore. And then sometimes there is an assignee and then the assignees closes the issue. So somebody may make an issue and assign it to me. And then when it's done, I close it, right? Mm. So uh, those are the three typical use cases, but it kind of depends a little bit, yeah. Cool. Other questions that deserve more immediate attention? Because we'll recommend on Friday anyway. Word of warning. Um, Sorry, not cost by us, but there may be rescheduling of that course, and uh, it's basically based on some, uh, yeah, scheduling issues uh, in the in the wider sense and course dependencies and so on. I'm not quite sure where. I believe the Friday session is the one that will move, not this week, but eventually, um, into some other slots based on availability. That's something we still need to figure out. Um, so, and um, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm a big fan of this, but unfortunately, it's not something we can avoid at this stage. Just a word of warning there. And once I uh, uh, hear about that it's actually happening and taking place, then I send an announcement uh, explicitly. Um, so you guys will know that you need to look at the team plan um, to, to ensure that you um, are on the right track. But in any case, we're following our agreement right now. We a... Um, Ah, yeah, good. Simon, uh, another question. What if you're unsure about what label to use? Better to guess or just leave it without it? Better to guess. Uh, the reason is otherwise we don't get notifications, right? So if that's the problem with uh, the GitLab issue tracker. If you don't have labels, you don't get notifications. So your issue may just be unseen. Um, uh, so just in worst case, use a wrong one. Or we can in invent actually a new label called unsure. <laughs> Perhaps I'll do that later on, uh, after immediately afterwards, and then you can just subscribe to it as well. So if you take a question as unsure, it means here's a question that is we are really unsure about or that is subject to relabeling, right? That's also an option we can do. So um, it's no big deal. But it's a very good point. Please label questions. Otherwise, we are likely don't seeing them. We had some uh, unfortunate experience with this. It's just an inconvenience there. But it's not a big deal because it's also your professionalism that should encourage you to think about this um, and, and annotate questions accordingly. So thank you very much for highlighting this. Cool. All right. I think I uh, know what I need to know. Um, and hopefully you know some of the aspects that you probably need to know for, for, for this um, course. Um, right. So we reconvene on Friday. Yes. Ah, get, yeah, they're good, 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 good homework. That's right. What to prepare for next lecture is asked in the chat, and that's a very good question. Uh, what I would encourage you to do, if you haven't done already, GitLab, please sign up for it. Very important. The other one is uh, get some sort of Linux running on your machine that may either be in a virtual box or if you run it natively, you did the homework already. 
Um, but it probably wouldn't hurt to have an instance you can play with, so in case you you know break it or whatever else or and so on. The good part about virtual box is that you can use the notion of snapshots. Um, I don't have the time right now to, to kind of. I don't think we should right now enforce, but rather look at it briefly next time. Um, so you can actually, uh, in case you fear that you're uh, doing something ill-fated, it's very easy to roll back to a previous version of your image, um, which is a very useful feature in contrast to um, actual deployment on your machine. So uh, just consider doing this um, as, as, um, as an alternative. Again, this particular Linux instance that we are going to be using there is really more like for playing around the widest sense. I mean, you will use it for, you can use it for development, but in VirtualBox, it's usually not that performant. So uh, you should look at it with care. Um, but um, it's um, it's good for training, right? So for kind of just playing around and um, uh, getting comfortable with Linux if you are not already, or follow some of the ideas that we talk about. Cool. All right. So uh, yeah, VirtualBox um, setup, Linux setup. It's the only thing you want to do for next session. We only have to two, we have two days anyway until then. Um, so it's not too much time to do anything much beyond it. Uh, use the issue tracker if you have issues, and then, uh, but also if you can respond to issues because that's exactly a point in time where uh, challenges scale. We have 70 students that, or let's say 50 of them, that actually do the installation and so on. Then you can start helping yourself because you most likely will find and solve issues at the same time more than we may. Okay. Um, good. If there's nothing else to be discussed, we reconvene on Friday and um, I'll post everything as I mentioned and we go from there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And thank you guys for joining. Say Mark and Marius. Um, yeah. Bye bye guys.